All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We are in week five. Time is uh, flying. We are in week five, and today we're going to go over the fall of mankind and how we are saved. So last week we talked about the creation of the world. We talked about uh, how God created the world, what the book of Genesis is trying to convey to us in creation. And I kind of hinted to you all that this week we talk about, so what happened? You know, God made everything good and he made man very good and everything was sort of on the, uh, in a good path. So what happened in the fall of mankind and how does God reconcile us once again uh, to him? You know, so um, just a reminder again about like sort of the quizzes and the readings that are on the Google Classroom, super important because like I said, most of the stuff that I talk about, I won't be able to go through in the detail that is required for you to really have a great understanding of what's going on. So the readings will really be helpful to sort of augment that. Um, these are sort of my objectives of what I would like to see you guys and be able to know uh, and to answer by the end of this talk or by the end of sort of going through everything and going through the readings and things like that. Um, what was life like in paradise? What was the role of the snake or the serpent? What is sin? How did man fall? What was the sin of Adam? What were the consequences of the fall? And what is meant by original sin. Okay, so those are the things that I'm hoping to uh, answer or at least partially answer uh, by the end of uh, our discussion today. The first humans were Adam and Eve and in the Orthodox Church, by the way, we believe I talked to you last week about like we don't necessarily believe in like seven days being strict seven days and things like that but we do believe in a, a real Adam and a real Eve and actually that's very necessary and actually none of the church fathers talk about Adam and Eve as metaphorical people. Uh, they talk about a real Adam and a real Eve. And this is very significant because if there is no real Adam and there is no real Eve, then there is no real fall, right? And, and, so, and actually Christ talked about Adam and Eve as real people. And, and so we don't believe in uh, Adam and Eve as metaphorical or allegorical people. God put uh, them, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden in paradise. And it was their duty to, like, to till it and to keep it, to maintain it. And actually, it had everything that they needed. It said that there in the book of Genesis tells us that it has every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Uh, in the middle of the garden, in the Garden of Eden, was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. So there are two separate trees. Sometimes we miss that when we're reading uh, the scripture, but there are two separate trees. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, you can eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, do not eat, for in that day that you eat, you will die. Okay? They lived without clothing. Okay? And that's actually very important. They lived without clothing because there were no bodily passions, because they were totally focused on God. So there was not an exa a ca like, a, like a problem, for example, of lust, right? They lived innocently uh, na in, in nakedness. Man was created, like I was telling you guys last week, in the image and likeness of God. And they were given dominion over the fishes, over the sea, over the birds, like over everything that was on the earth. St. John Chrysostom, he says, Man lived on earth like an angel. He was in the body, but he had no bodily needs. Like a king adorned with purple and a diadem and clothed in royal garb, he took delight in the dwelling of paradise, having an abundance in everything. Before the fall, men lived in paradise like angels. They were not inflamed with lust, were not kindled by other passions either, were not burdened with bodily needs, but being created entirely incorruptible and immortal, they did not even need the covering of clothing. That's St. John from his homily about uh, the book of Genesis. Paradise is an image of the age to come, the everlasting day, the future that has no cycle, no seasons, no years, no months, no minutes, anything like that. Paradise. And, and like the heavenly kingdom that we look forward to is one glorious day without routine work or sleep or anything like that. That, that is what we are destined to return to if we live and follow faithfully in Christ. So what went wrong in paradise? Adam and Eve were happily like engaged in their life in paradise when the serpent came to Eve. Okay, And I want to read a little bit. I put Genesis 3 verses 1 through 6 and I'm going to read that. If you guys have Bibles or are familiar with your Bible, you can read along. Otherwise, I'm going to read it for you. I think, I don't think I have it on my slides, yeah. I'll read it for you. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, 
We may eat of the trees of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave her husband, gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So actually, going back to those verses, we can see, it's important to see how the devil, um, the serpent, by the way, is the devil, uh, how the devil sort of uh, spoke to Eve and convinced her to eat of the fruit. He's very cunning in, 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 his, in his ways. He, he doesn't tell really any outright lies, but he sort of twists the truth to mislead Eve. He tempts her and he tricks her. And why is that important for you to understand is because this is how sin and evil enters into the picture as far as like mankind. But this is how sin and evil enter our own lives. You know, how many times right before I do something that I know I really shouldn't do, I, I convince myself with the strangest reasons and the strangest rationale why it's okay. And it's only not until after I've, com I've done the thing where I think to myself, what was I thinking or, or what was I going through or what was happening that would make me uh, want to do that. So like when he says to her, he, like when he when he's talking to her, he says, did God tell you not to eat of any tree of the garden? Like he's asking her, like, why did he tell you not to eat anything? And actually, that that's actually wasn't true. Like, right, he just, she, God just told them not to eat of just one tree. And he said, you're not going to die if you do that. Actually, what's going to happen is your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Technically, this is true, right? They, they, he, they became like God, knowing good and evil knowing bad and good. But prior to that, they only knew what? Good, right? They only knew goodness. So yes, that was true, but actually that was to their detriment. That was not to their benefit. Being made in the image and likeness of God, Adam and Eve both had free will. We talked about, when we talked about creation, one of the unique characteristics that humans are created with is free will. So they, when they were made in the image and likeness of God, Adam and Eve both had free will. They could choose to stay faithful to God and to be his servant. Or, and what they end up doing is, we see both of them choosing to run away from, uh, or turn away from, like that <coughs> trusting relationship with God, right? They ignore His directions, they, they separate themselves from Him, and they rely on uh, their own will, okay? And actually, this is the nature of sin in general. To separate from God, to be self-centered, to act based on my own will without regard for God or what His commands or what He thinks or what His rules or anything like that. What was the consequence of the sin of, of Adam and Eve? One of the first results is that they became ashamed and realized that they were naked and they covered themselves with fig leaves. They were no longer living a life of uh, contemplation with God, but now they were so centered even on their own bodies. Their souls weren't any, anymore in communion with God their bodily desires, their passions are really what kind of took charge. And they, they became sort of ashamed and self-centered because of their lack of clothing. They began like the passionate earthly life that we all now participate in. What are they supposed to do now that they are separated from God? It says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So now, all of a sudden, they're hiding from God. We know that they're separated from God because He had to call them. He's looking for them. Where are you? God knew, knew, of course, where they were. But they were separated from Him and they were no longer in communion with Him in the same way that they were before. God was calling them to bring, him, to bring them back into relationship with Him. For them to repent. For them to acknowledge their poor choice. For them to ask for forgiveness. Having lost their like contemplation with God, now they're separated from Him. Now they're interested in or ashamed of their nakedness. They can't even respond properly. What do they do? If you look in the book of Genesis, and I encourage you guys to read from chapter 3, Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The woman whom you gave to be with me she gave me of the tree and I ate. And then Eve says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So who did Adam blame? Eve. And who did Eve blame? 
the serpent, right? Neither of them accepted responsibility for the, the choice, the bad choice that they made. They respond with self-justification, okay? Being separated from God, they are now destined to suffer the consequences of eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that God described to them earlier. They now knew evil, and actually they were blinded by evil. And it was through their sin that actually death entered into the whole world. We hear this repeated by the Apostle St. Paul several times. In the book of Romans he says, As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for, that all, for, this all, for thus all have sinned. And then he also says the wages of sin is death. What was their particular sin? Pride. They thought they could become like God. They acted out of their own self-interest. Right? What did the serpent tell Eve? When you eat this, you're going to be like God. God doesn't want you to be like Him. That's why you should eat. And so they wanted to be like God and they ate. And then God says, after, he, after they eat, God says, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put his hand out and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he didn't want him to eat of the tree of life. Why? God took them out of the Garden of Eden so that they wouldn't eat of the tree of life, so that they wouldn't live forever in their eternal punishment. And then it says, the book of Genesis tells us that the God, God sent them out of the garden to till the, like from the place that they were. And he drove them out and he placed an angel, a cherubim, at the, at the east of the garden with a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the tree of life. So now they had no access to the tree of life. Now instead of eternal life in union with God, Adam and Eve found themselves separated from God because of their pride. They are separated from God because of their pride. The word sin literally means missing the mark. It means like a failure to be what I should be and what I was created to be. Originally, like we were talking about last week, man was created in the image and likeness of God, to live in union with God's divine life, to rule over all creation in the same way that God rules over everything. Man's failure in this task is his sin, and that's why we call it, or we know it as the fall. Okay? The fall of man means that man failed in his God-given vocation. That's really the essence of Genesis chapter 3. That mankind, Adam and Eve, were seduced by evil, by the serpent, into believing that they could be like God by their own will and effort. In the Orthodox tradition, the eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is actually interpreted also as man's actual taste of evil, their experience with evil. Sometimes it's also like the eating is represented like by St. Gregory the Theologian as man's attempt to go beyond what was possible for him. His attempt to do what's not really yet in his power to realize. It's clear doctrine in orthodoxy that we failed in our original vocation. We disobeyed, mankind disobeyed God's command through pride, through jealousy, through a lack of humble gratitude. And we, missed, we, missed, we sinned and missed the mark. In the Bible and in orthodox theology, these elements all go together. Sin, evil, the devil, suffering, and death. All of those are a common result of man's rebellion against God and his loss of communion with God. Okay, Again, that's like the primary idea or concept behind Genesis chapter 3 and the, and the chapters which follow all the way until the calling of Abraham. We'll see if you read from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11, sin begets more sin, begets more sin, things become worse and worse in, on, on the earth, and ultimately there's corruption and death everywhere and in everything. Man is still created in the image of God. That can't be changed. But he fails to keep this image pure and to retain like the likeness, the divine likeness of God. So he defiles his humanity with evil. He perverts the, his humanity, deforms the humanity. And so he's not, no longer a pure reflection of God. The world itself also remains good and very good, like we said when he created it, but it shares of the consequences of the created master, humankind, sin. And it suffers as well. So that's through the sin of man, death and sin entered into the whole world, and the whole world became under the rule of Satan, and, and lies in wickedness, like St. John tells us in his letter. So in a nutshell, this is the fundamental message. Man and the world are in need to be saved. God gives, by the way, this promise of salvation from the very beginning. And that promise becomes fulfilled in the history of 
We're going through from the promises of Abraham all the way to our Lord Jesus Christ. Right from the beginning, when he's in the same time that he is cursing uh, Eve and telling her that she's going to give pa have pain in childbirth because of as a result of sin, she says he says that his her son will crush the head of the serpent. And actually, that, that is a prophecy about uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. If we look at the promise that God promised to Abraham, it says that Abraham believed in God, and from him came the people of Israel, from whom, according to the flesh, came our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of creation. So the entire history of the Old, Old Testament finds its fulfillment in Christ. All that happened to the children of Abraham happened in view of like the eventual and final destruction of sin and of death by Christ. The covenant that God made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who actually Jacob's name was changed to Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, the story of Joseph, the Passover, the Exodus, all these things that maybe some of you are familiar with in the Old Testament, all of those have their final purpose and their meaning in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? He's the one who comes from God the Father to save the people from their sins, to open the tombs, and to grant eternal life. Okay? I want to talk about for a couple of minutes about original sin. What's, what is original sin? I've mentioned already a few times, God created man in his own image. And it says in, in Genesis, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And he also says that, that Adam and Eve were good. And they had good human nature and was created in the image of God. After the fall, as I mentioned before, the image becomes distorted. The human nature is wounded, weakened, damaged by sin. Corruption, a predisposition to sin, a tendency to sin, invaded human nature. In Genesis chapter 5, it says that Adam begot a son in his own likeness after his image. So now we are created, of course we have the image of God, but we are created in the image and likeness of who? Of Adam, who now has a distorted image of God. That makes sense. So our corrupt human nature is born with Adam's sin, because we are in the loins of Adam, as St. Paul says, while we sin. So even though he sinned, we didn't actually eat of the forbidden tree. We are born with sin. We are not born with, like, I'm the one who actually ate of the tree. But we are, we are born with this sin because he is representative of all of mankind. Okay? St. Paul describes a similar situation to give you the concept, like when he's talking about we sinned in the loins of Adam. St. Paul describes something very similar in the book of Hebrews. When Abraham, who was the, basically the father of the people of Israel, he met this, uh, this priest and king named Mel Melchizedek. Okay? And when he met him, he paid tithes to Melchizedek. And St. Paul, is, uh, when, he, when he describes this interaction between Abraham and Melchizedek, he says, even Levi, and I'll explain this in a second for, for those of you who maybe don't have the background, even Levi who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Levi, for those of you who don't know, are one of the 12, 12 tribes of Israel, and they were the priestly tribe. Okay, One of the rules of the Old Testament life, the people, in the people of Israel, they would pay their tithe. Right now, when you, when you tithe, you tithe to the church. In the Old Testament, the, the, the people of Israel would tithe to the priests, the Levites. The Levites were the priestly tribe. So everybody would give 10% of their goods and their income and things like that, to the Levites, and actually that's how the Levites would survive. And the Levites would serve in the temple and, and do the, the, the temple worship and the ministry for the people of Israel. And so what St. Paul is saying is, Levi, who was the priest, is actually the one tithing to Melchizedek. Why was Levi tithing to Melchizedek? Because Melchizedek is a symbol of Christ. And so St. Paul is making the, 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 the concept that even the priest, the Old Testament priesthood, recognize the superiority and the honor of the priesthood of Christ above the Old Testament priesthood. But all of that to say, he's just talking about the why I brought it up is the concept of even though the Levites actually never gave any tithes to Melchizedek, right? To Melchizedek it, was, it was Abraham. But St. Paul considers it to be as if Levi did it because he was in the loins of Abraham. King David also, he says, this is just some, some verses to speak about and to show the doctrine of original sin is something that is both scriptural and according to tradition. 
King David says in the Psalms, one of the most famous Psalms that I hope you guys will end up memorizing because it's a, it's a Psalm that we say very often in our prayers in the Coptic Orthodox tradition. He says, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. So even in, in, in my conception, I'm conceived in sin, according to King David. It's from Psalm 51. This corrupt and sinful human nature that we receive is sentenced to death by God. Because, as St. Paul tells us in Romans, the wages of sin, or the result of sin, or the consequence of sin, is death. So death reigned over all of humanity, as St. Paul tells us, because he says, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin. He's talking about Adam. And thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And he says in addition to all that above, the whole creation was also affected by the fall. God told Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake. So Adam and Eve were cursed and also the entire world. God had given dominion of the world to Adam and due to Adam's sin, death entered into the world. So in essence, by the disobedience of Adam, humankind now all is under the punishment of sin and death. It's not that we are specifically guilty of the sin that Adam did. I didn't eat of the tree, you did not eat of that tree. But humankind sinned against God in Adam and bears the consequences of this. So we became sinners in Adam because our existence as persons. We were in him. So we became complicit in Adam's disobedience. And actually, the reason that that's very significant is because that ends up tending to come full circle. If I were to ask you, what did you do to deserve the sin of Adam in, in, in your life? You would rightly answer me and say, nothing. I didn't eat a tree. It wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything. And in the same way, what did you do in order to acquire the righteousness of God through Christ? Nothing. Right? Christ is the one who came, descended, put on sin for us, became sin for us, so that we could put on His righteousness. So in the same way that we did nothing, in order to, to have this sin, also we did nothing to receive this uh, salvation. All we have to do is accept the gift of God and the grace of God and His righteousness. So our, our church doesn't teach that as persons we participated in Adam's sin. Of course not. You weren't there, I wasn't there. Right? But we became sinners in Him, not with Him, because we didn't exist. Just as we become sinners in Adam without personally having committed any particular sin, we also become righteous in Christ without claiming any credit except accepting faith in Christ and uniting with Him through baptism in the Holy Eucharist and things, things like this. That's a lot for me to just, I want to summarize in just three bullet points. Human nature is born corrupt, having a predisposition and a tendency to sin. Human nature is born with Adam's sin. Human nature is born sentenced to death by God. Okay, that's, that's the orthodox understanding of original sin. So then, okay, now I've presented to you the problem. How are we saved? What's the solution? Right? And these are the questions that I hope we can, we can answer. How did salvation begin? Why did God send His Son? What is the difference between general salvation and personal salvation? What is it meant when we say Christ conquered death? How did Christ establish the church for our benefit? What are the conditions of our personal salvation? Okay? The doctrine of salvation is the central doctrine of the Orthodox Church. It should be the thing that is most important to you because it's most relevant to your life, right? If I feel that I, that I believe that, I, that there is a problem, that I need to know, okay, how do I solve it? How can I reconcile myself with God? How did our salvation begin? Our salvation begins with the incarnation of Christ. God sent, God the Father sent His Son into the world to heal human race and to bring the world back in union with Him. St. Paul says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And St. John, in his gospel, says a very famous verse that you guys might be familiar with, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And St. John, again, the same St. John, he writes in his letter, We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding, that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. St. Luke, in the Gospel, he records for us the story of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God's conception and birth. His birth was a miracle brought by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. He is conceived by the Holy Spirit, and it was from St. Mary that our Lord Jesus Christ took His humanity 
and he became like us in everything except for sin. But at the same time, he remained totally God. St. Paul writes, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So he's completely God, but he has now taken on flesh. Through his incarnation, God becomes like us, uniting humanity with his divinity. This united nature, fully God, fully man, is important. Because Jesus revealed to us God in a way that was different than any other prophet ever did. Christ united human nature with the divine nature, showing us, or showing all of us how we can share in the life and the glory of God. His, our Lord Jesus Christ's sinless way of life, His uniting of human will with God's will, opens the way for us to live life as God intended, in union with Him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a quote for you from St. Basil. He says, You did not turn yourself away from ever, forever from your creature, whom you made, O good one. Nor did you forget the work of your hands. Through the tender compassion of your mercy, you visited him in various ways. You sent prophets. You performed mighty works by your saints, who in every generation were well-pleasing to you. You spoke to us by the mouths of your servants, the prophets, foretelling us the salvation which was to come. You appointed angels as guardians. And when the fullness of time had come, you spoke to us through your son himself, by whom you did also make the ages, who being the radiance of your glory and the image of your person, upholding all things by the word of his power, thought it not robbery to be equal to you, God the Father. He was God before the all the ages, yet he appeared on earth and lived among men, becoming incarnate of a holy virgin. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being likened to the body of our lowliness, that he might liken us to the image of his glory. You can see very, very early on in the church, and uh, uh, th that same understanding of what happened in salvation is the same thing we as Orthodox Christians pre preach until today. The reason I put this bullet, the Third Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, the union of the human and the divine nature of Christ was affirmed in this council. Actually, uh, I might have put in some of the readings, but these are like sort of extra readings. I don't think I put them in the required readings. The concept of Christ being completely God and completely man in one nature is essential to our salvation. Because God taking on human nature is essential for human nature to be saved. And God being divine is essential for Him to have the, the capability, the power and the authority to save us. So that perfect union of God and man is essential. Why did God send His Son? I believe in your readings, either this week or last week, I, I put you guys either the whole book or at least parts of On the Incarnation. And the book On the Incarnation speaks very explicitly about why did God send His Son for our salvation? Why did He do that? He could have saved us. Could He have saved us in any other way? Okay, and St. Athanasius talks about that. According to St. Athanasius, part of the problem was that sin caused the humans to slip away into what he calls like non-being or non-existence and to live under the sway of death. So Christ came to bring life. He says, Our own cause was the occasion of His descent and our own transgression evoked the words of love for human beings, so that the Lord both came to us and appeared among human beings. For we were the purpose of His embodiment. For our salvation, He so loved human beings as to come to, to be and appear in a human body. For St. Athanasius, as he's writing and describing, human sin cut us off from the grace which we were designed to live in. God as Creator was perfectly good. And so He didn't want to leave His creation to perish. If you think about when I talked about uh, last week about creation, what did God create us out of? Dust. Dust. What did God create the dust out of? Nothing. nothing. So we were created out of nothing. And when, when God tells Adam, you were, out, you were made of dust and to dust you will return, St. Athanasius takes us to understand, even, goes even further to say, we are going to go back into actually non-existence. We are created out of nothing and we're destined to go back, if we're not connected to God, back into non-existence. And for St. Athanasius, he was saying, God being perfectly good could not just leave his creation to perish. Listen to what he says. It was therefore right not to permit human beings to be carried away by corruption because this would be improper and unworthy of the goodness of God. It was not worthy of the goodness of God that those created by him should be corrupted through deception. It was supremely improper that the workmanship of God and human beings should disappear, 
either through their own negligence or through the deceit of demons. So Athanasius is saying in a, in a nutshell, even though it was our fault and even though we didn't listen, even though we, we, we should bear the brunt of our situation, God being perfectly good, it doesn't make sense that God would make uh, creation in his own image and own likeness and then just leave it to go into nothingness. Because human beings are not just like any other part of creation, right? They're made like God. And so because they're made like God, God in His, in his mercy and His justice wouldn't just leave them to their own devices. So he says, humans have been corrupted by sin. Their nature is forever changed by their effects. And now human, the human, like mankind, is spiraling downward worse and worse. Corruption, the word corruption was a very important word for St. Athanasius. It wasn't just that, you know, humans did something bad to God and wronged Him. It was actually that sin changed the nature of, of mankind. He talks about, St. Athanasius asks a question that's a, a really nice question. And I'm sure some of you have thought about this sometimes. When Adam and Eve sinned, why couldn't they go to God and be like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, or that was my fault, or I apologize. And why couldn't God just say, no problem, I, I understand, everyone makes mistakes, and we just kind of like, and forgive them, right? God is, a, God is a loving God, God is a forgiving God, why didn't he do that? Why is that not, why is that not possible? St. Athanasius answers this question in the book on the Incarnation. He says, repentance merely halts sin. If then there, they were only the offense and not the consequence of corruption, repentance would have been fine. So St. Athanasius is saying is, if it was just a matter of like apologizing and making it okay, yeah, of course, you could. But actually the problem was, our nature was forever changed as a result of sin. So he's answering the question here, why is it enough for humans to just say, I'm so sorry, and move on? The problem was not just, I've offended God. It was corruption of human nature. A change then of human nature was required. And that was what was offered in the Incarnation. I'll read you another quote from on the Incarnation. For the Word, when he says the Word, he means Christ. For the Word, realizing that in no other way could the corruption of human beings be undone, except simply by dying, yet being immortal and the Son of the Father, the Word was not able to die. <coughs> For this reason, he takes to himself a body capable of death, in order that, in participating in the Word who is above all, might be sufficient for death on behalf of all, and through the indwelling word would remain incorruptible, and so corruption might henceforth cease from all by the grace of the resurrection. So he's saying, God the Son, he's like, I, I, God can't die, but death is necessary in order to uh, fulfill the, the, the promise of God that said if you, if you eat of the, the fruit that you will die, and also for the human nature to be re, like recreated, reborn. The, 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 the body has to die. And, and God the Son cannot die. He is God. So what is his solution? To take on flesh in order to take on flesh capable of dying. This is why Christ, this is why the Son of God had to be human. This is why we confess and, and is an essential tenet of orthodoxy that we believe that Christ is fully human. The human nature that the Son of God took was both representative of and connected to human nature more broadly, okay? So I'll read you another quote from St. Athanasius. For being above all, the word of God consequently, by offering his own temple and his bodily instrument as a substitute for all, fulfilled in death that which was required. And being with all, through the likeness in the body, the incorruptible Son of God, consequently clothed all with the incorruptibility in the promise concerning the resurrection. And now the very corruption of death no longer holds ground against human beings, because of the indwelling word in them through the one body. By Christ being God, we receive the promise and the possibility of incorruptibility and resurrection. He was able to defeat the devil by his victory over death, destroying the greatest power of Satan, which is death. Christ took upon himself the sickness of the entire world. So through his death, life, death, and resurrection, he accomplished three things. First, the forgiveness of sins. Second, freedom from the bondage of death. With his resurrection, death doesn't have to be feared anymore. It's not the end of our existence, but a passage into immortal life. Actually, in the liturgy, we always say, there is no death for your servants, but a departure. 
simply a departure. We know we will face death, but we now, when we, now we know we're facing it, knowing that there is no, like what St. Paul says, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So now I have freedom from the bondage of death through his life and death and resurrection. And thirdly, the third thing that uh, Christ's death and resurrection accomplished for us is the transfiguration of human nature. Okay, The resurrection is the restoration of our human nature. As we were created in the image and likeness of God previously before the fall, God sent his son to re-establish human nature and establish the church here on earth for our healing. He taught his disciples so that they could teach others. He empowered them with the Holy Spirit and established sacraments of the church for our benefit, in order for us to participate in this life that he has given us. So if God did this for us, what is it that we have to do? If Christ saved mankind through his life, his ministry on earth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, what is there or why is there anything on our part to do? What's the difference between our, like the general salvation and our personal salvation? Or what do those words mean, general salvation and personal salvation? The apostles teach us to distinguish between the truth of the salvation of mankind as a whole and the necessity for a personal reception and assimilation of the gift of salvation to each individual. And the latter salvation depends on each of us individually. St. Paul says in Ephesians, a very famous verse, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So if you read that, St. Paul is saying, you did not do anything in order to have salvation. You could not have saved yourself. There's no amount of prayers, liturgies that you attend. There's no amount of uh, saying sorry. There's no amount of being good. There's no amount of giving to the poor that could have made you worthy of salvation. Your salvation was given to you as a free gift from God. That same St. Paul who says, you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, says this also in Philippians. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who both works in you to will and to do for his good pleasure. Our personal salvation is, consists in the attainment of eternal life in God in the kingdom of heaven. We're told, for example, in scripture, nothing unclean can enter the kingdom of God. Since God is, scripture tells us, God is light and there's no darkness in him. Those who enter the kingdom of God have to be sons of light. In the book of Hebrews, it says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So without holiness, I cannot see God. So Christ, he came into the world to do the following things. To free us from the shackles of death, open a path to mankind for our individual salvation. And by this I mean to direct the hearts of men to search, to thirst for the kingdom of God. He, he came to give power, to give help on the path of salvation for the acquirement of personal spiritual purity and sanctity. The freeing from the shackles of death and the opening the path to mankind in its entirety has been accomplished by Christ all by himself, without us, without even us asking. The second part, the direction of our hearts to search, to thirst for the kingdom of God, for our personal spiritual purity, for our personal sanctity and holiness, depends on ourselves, although of course helped by the activity and the grace of the Holy Spirit. But it depends on our free will. He opens a path to paradise for us, the possibility of personal salvation for each of us. He did this by his victory over death, Christ. But he came to direct also the hearts of the people and did this through the establishment of the church and for him sending us his Holy Spirit. In Orthodox theology, redemption is not seen as like in judicial terms where like one is just redeemed as a result of the fall and granted justification. Redemption is an invitation to participate in and be in union with God as a result of the incarnation of Christ to become healed. Okay, It's a gracious and divine gift which is bestowed on us by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Saint Athanasius says, The Son of God became man so that we might become 
like God or become God. Okay? So salvation is becoming God or becoming like God. That Christ is both human and divine, united without mixture or confusion or separation or division, which we say in our liturgy. Mankind is not naturally divine. We're creatures. Just as Christ's human nature did not become mixed or confused with his divine nature, also us in the resurrection will not become mixed or confused with God. There's always a difference between God and, and, and mankind. St. Peter tells us we're going to be partakers of the divine nature. The deepest thirst that exists in mankind is not just for moral improvement. If you come to church because you just want to be a better person, that's actually, we're, we're missing the mark. That's not our goal, to just be better people, to, to be more moral, you know, to, to do the right thing. But our, our goal actually is union with God. For this to take place, God gives himself man through his grace. And in that way, man is fully united with God and participates in his life, but at the same time still remains man. How does the Orthodox view of salvation differ from uh, men, uh, other, other groups of uh, denominations of Christianity, especially in the West, for example, like Salvation in a Moment. Actually, there's a book that I put on the... On the re I don't know if I meant to put this in the required readings or if it's just in the extra readings for people. There's a book I, by Clark Carlton called The Life, which is the Orthodox Doctrine and Salvation. It's, it's an Eastern Orthodox book, but many of the, most of what was in there is, is really nice and really helpful. In the West, there are people who believe, or in, in some Protestant denominations, there's this concept of, like people will come and ask you, have you ever been saved? Have you been saved? Maybe someone has stopped you in the street and said that to you. Have you ever been saved? <clears throat> for an evangelical person, for a person coming from a different uh, Christian background, to be saved means to be declared not guilty by God. In other words, it means that like, when God looks at that person, he sees Christ's righteousness instead of my sinfulness. And so now, instead of, like through this atonement, like we're substituted by Christ on the cross, satisfies God's uh, justice and honor and calms down his wrath, and that saved person now stands before God justified, cleared of all charges against him, and now he can enter into heaven joyfully. Those, according to this, like I want to say this is according to like people who believe in salvation of the mo in a moment, which is rejected by the Orthodox Church. People, according to them, who reject Christ as their personal God and Savior remain in their sin that was passed down from Adam. And so when God looks at those people, He sees them. He doesn't see the righteousness of His Son. He sees the sinful state of that sinner. And so those people are cast into hell as a deserved punishment for people who uh, violate God's laws. That's why in their mind, you can see how in their mind, how once saved, always saved makes sense. Right? Right? If one has accepted Christ according to them as their uh, Savior, then one can be confident that Christ will keep his promise. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is what it says in the book of Acts. Being saved for them is only a matter of accepting Christ and, and God then changes his view towards you forever. In the Orthodox Church, it's a completely different story. And actually that, is, that, that concept of salvation in, the moment, in a moment is rejected by Scripture, is rejected by the tradition of the church is reject, rejected by the church fathers and their teachings. For the Orthodox Christian, salvation is not a matter of, of how God views man. God is unchangeable and always looks on people, humankind, with what? Love. No matter what our actions are. His love is unconditional. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, our Lord Jesus Christ says, For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust, for the Orthodox Christian, it is our ability to relate to God and not God's ability to relate to man. That's the problem, right? There's a, that's why there's a difference between general salvation of mankind and personal salvation. For the Orthodox Christian, salvation means that we attain the likeness of God through which we attain a real union with Him. Salvation is, is, is referring to the spiritual state of the individual. So Orthodox Christians, we, we, we'd be hesitant to say, to make any pronouncement about our own salvation. To an Orthodox Christian, that's like presumption of the divine judgment of God. Because salvation involves both faith and works. But the issue of faith and works is not an issue like that we think, are you saved by faith or saved by works? The Orthodox Christian would say, both are required for our salvation. We can't be saved by faith alone or by works alone. 
Orthodox Christians also do not believe in the notion that we are once saved, always saved. Salvation is a continuing task for us as Orthodox Christians. I want to read this. Uh, let me see if I have it in this. Uh, from St. Paul's letter to second, uh, second letter to the Corinthians. He says, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. Look at carefully what St. Paul says. St. Paul is saying here, he uses the word deliver three times. One time he says it in the past, one time he says it in the present, one time he says it in the future. In God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death. When did God deliver us from so great a death? His work on the cross. right? He, when, he, when, he, when he died on the cross, he defeated death. We say in the resurrection hymns, by his death he trampled on death. And that was something done in the past. He, that was something that done in a time. He does deliver us, meaning he offers us the opportunity to repent from sins and be delivered from this bondage of sin on a daily basis. When I, when I repent, when I <coughs> confess, when I take the sacrament of the Eucharist for the remission of my sins, as we'll learn about when we talk about the sacraments, we are delivered from death. And then he does deliver us, meaning when we are awaiting in hope of the resurrection, the second coming, that he will save those who have uh, been faithful to him, that he will deliver us. It's a future, that's a future thing, that he will still deliver us. So in the Orthodox Church, we wouldn't say, you know, Oh, I was saved on you know February 25th, 2023 or whatever. Our salvation is an ongoing thing that begins with our baptism and ends with our, the last breath that we take. In a nutshell, yes, Christ saved mankind by his life, death, and resurrection, but he invites us to participate in his salvation, and we, God respecting our free will, God uh, makes the choice for us that we must, or allows us to choose, we must accept this invitation. God doesn't force himself on anyone. He even established the church for our benefit to help us as we walk on the path of salvation. Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit to remain with the apostles forever after his resurrection. He granted them the power of the Holy Spirit when he says to the apostles, he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And then 10 days after his ascension, the Lord sent His Holy Spirit upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. We celebrate that, the day of Pentecost, 50 days after we celebrate the Feast of the Resurrection. In the form of tongues of fire. In the Holy Spirit, in His divine power, is given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. That's what St. Peter says in his letter. These gifts are in the church, which Christ founded on earth. And they compromise the means of our sanctification and our salvation. The church is not just a social organization, but is the presence of the life of Christ on earth. The life of the church is the life of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. It's not simply a place where we come to learn about God. In His church, we experience and participate in the life of Christ. By joining the church, we are uniting ourselves with the body of Christ. The church is not a building but a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit and who share in His life and bringing life to the rest of the world. And it's through the sacraments that you, we are united by Christ. Most specifically, the <coughs> sacraments of baptism, chrismation, Eucharist, and confession. And we'll talk about those sacraments. We have a whole uh, talk, I think, either next week or the week after, uh, centering on the, the sacraments. The church, then, is a spiritual hospital. The Eucharist being the medicine of our immortality. For those of us who are properly prepared, grace works in us in the church in many ways, like a medicine when we're working through, uh, like working through the sacraments of the church. But we need to have proper guidance so that this medicine could be properly applied. Right? If you have a doctor, for those of you who go to the doctor, you get medication, you have to take it in a certain way, for a certain time. Our Lord Jesus Christ was known to us as the great physician. He brings those who are sick with sin to his church. That's why I always try to make sure that we understand when you go into the church, you should expect to find 
people that are messed up, that are broken people, people that have made mistakes. Because this is the arena in which we become healed from that sin. You do not come to church because you're perfect. You do not come to church because you are perfect. Actually, uh, I was with His uh, Eminence, Bishop Yusuf, Metropolitan Yusuf, a few weeks ago, and he was uh, talking about a quote that's from a really nice book um, called Becoming Orthodox. This book is uh, uh, kind of like a semi-biography of this man, Father Peter Gilquist. Him and his entire congregation converted to Orthodox, and he wrote a book about it. And one of the things he mentioned in the book is he says, like, when he's speaking about the church itself, he's saying there is no such thing as a perfect church. As, as far as like the people in it, there's no such thing as a perfect church. And he said, even if there was a perfect church, the minute you walk into it, you've ruined it because you're imperfect. So, you know, even if you found a perfect church, you shouldn't go. Because if you go, the minute you walk in, you, 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 you ruin this church that's no longer perfect. So when you come to the church, I expect to find imperfect people doing imperfect things, working out their salvation in fear and trembling. So what are the conditions for my personal salvation? What do I need to do? What is my, how do I say yes to, that, to God's free gift? I begin with faith in, in, in God and, truth, uh, and the truth of the scripture. And we receive the seed of our salvation in baptism and chrismation. We call baptism the, the, the gateway to the sacraments. Because by, by baptism we enter into the rest of the sacramental life of the church. Also through repentance, uh, in, in Greek metanoia, change of mind, we humble ourselves to receive God and to seek to change our behaviors that are uh, disconnected to the likeness of God. By prayer and fasting, we open our hearts to God for His grace to help us. Through the church sacraments, we cultivate the seed that was given to us in baptism and receive more and more His grace. With grace and the right choices, we grow closer and closer to God. And then after death, we will all know God and God will know us. And we'll discuss this path of salvation kind of a little bit uh, further in a, different, uh, in a different talk. What do we believe as Orthodox Christians about death and the final judgment? What is death? For most people, death is the end of life. For Orthodox Christians, it's the beginning of a new life. In spiritual terms, death is the separation of the soul from the body. St. Paul says it is the deliverance of the soul from prison. Or he also calls it a departure. That's why we call it a departure in our liturgy. Even when we talk about, like when we read the lives of the saints, we say on this day where we commemorate the departure of so-and-so. We don't say commemorate the death. Death for us spiritually means complete and utter separation from God. There is no death. That's why we say there is no death for your servant, but a departure. St. Peter says, putting off the, calls it putting off the body. And in Acts, he calls it sleep. St. Paul tells us there is judgment after death. It is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. This is what's called the particular judgment. What I mean by that is after our body gives up its physical life, the soul leaves and it goes to a state of blessedness or a state of torment according to its deeds, according to your works. But that's not the final state of like where there's full blessedness or torment is felt. This comes in the final judgment when the body and the soul are reunited. We're told in scripture that there is a second coming of Christ. So what is the second coming or what is the, the final judgment? On this day will be accomplished the universal resurrection of the dead and in a transfigured appearance. St. Paul says that the resurrection of the dead is actually what makes us Christian. Christ showed us the way through death to a new transfigured life through his resurrection and his uh, kind of being with his disciples during his 40 days before his ascension. If we don't believe in this, or if, if we don't believe in this, we can't believe in the resurrection of Christ. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, St. Paul says, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is also in vain. And then he continues, he says, Yes, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. So as Orthodox Christians, one of the major tenets of orthodoxy is the bodily resurrection on, uh, at, the end, at the end of the ages. We will, we will rise again, soul and body, a glorified body in the resurrection. But now Christ has risen from the dead, St. Paul continues, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Kind of echoing what I was saying earlier on in the beginning of this talk, 
when Adam, in Adam we all sinned, in the same way, in Christ, all of us who choose to believe in Him will be made alive. What will our new bodies be like in, after our resurrection? We know from the transfigured presence of Christ a little bit of what that would be like. Essentially, it will be the same in appearance, but we will be transfigured. The bodies of the righteous will be incorrupt and immortal, free from infirmities and weaknesses. They're not going to have bodily needs. The new life will be more like the angels. St. Paul says, Brethren, not all flesh is alike, but there is one kind for men, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are celestial or earthly bodies, I mean uh, heavenly bodies, and there are terrestrial or earthly bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So is the resurrection of the dead. This is all in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. He's speaking about our body. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It's sown in a physical body, it is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it says in 1 Corinthians, Thus the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life beginning spirit. The world as we know it here now on earth is not eternal, but our souls are eternal. Okay. That's the end of my talk about as far as like uh, mankind and the fall of mankind and how we're saved. Uh, as I'm trying to do every week at the end of the, the talk, I'm going to talk to you about something like specific about the Orthodox Church and our liturgical life and our prayer life so that you can begin to participate in those things and understand those things a little bit better. So today what I want to talk about is the Coptic prayer book of ours. Okay? And some of you will call it the Agbeya. Agbeya just means in Coptic, uh, prayer book of our book of hours that just means it just means that so like the that the so if you hear people referring it to as, as the Igbeya, what they mean is the prayer book of hours it's the same thing the book of hours contains prayers for seven different uh, uh, hours throughout the day it doesn't mean by the way that the prayer itself lasts an hour that's just the way the timing is divided okay the the, the seven hours are I think Chris it looks like Chris is uh, passing out Igbeyas for people so that you can have them and uh, can use them, begin to pray with them and, and, and use them in your prayer life. It's, it's, if, if you want to take one, if you don't have one, that would be nice. There are seven hours in the prayer book and each one has a theme according or corresponding to the events of the life of Christ. Okay, And actually the, the timing of the hours represent Jewish timing conventions. If you guys remember way back in maybe like the second or third lecture, I talked to you about how many of our liturgical worship is taken from Jewish worship. Right, and so these hours and these designations are coming from the Jewish way of like talking about time. So, for example, the third hour is equivalent to maybe roughly 9 a.m., which means ideally you would pray the, ninth, the, the, the third hour at 9 a.m. But it can be prayed at, at any time. You don't always have to follow that super strictly. Like for example, on Sundays when we, we when we pray liturgy, uh, liturgy is from for those of you who don't know, it's from 8 until about 10:45 or 11. During the liturgy, we pray the third and sixth hour of the prayer book of hours, which is technically the 9 a.m. prayer and the 12 p.m. prayer, right? Even though we're praying at around 8.30 or, or 9. So it's not like, uh, in a sense, strictly followed. You know, I wouldn't say to myself, okay, well, since it's past 6 o'clock, I can no longer pray the first hour, and now I have to pray. I have to wait till 9 in order to pray the, ninth hour, the third hour. Each hour is, is composed of an introduction, which includes the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving and Psalm 50. Remember when I said to you this prayer, Psalm 50 or Psalm 51 in the, in the non Septuagint Bibles, is a, a, a prayer that, or a psalm that many people have memorized? It's because it's the introduction to the prayer book of ours. And so most of the people who are cradle Orthodox, have been born in the church, lived in the church their entire life, have Psalm 50 memorized because they pray it on a daily basis. And actually, I would encourage you all, maybe as a beginning, in the morning and in the evening, to pray Our Father, the Thanksgiving prayer and Psalm 50. It really wouldn't take you more than three to five minutes, something like that, but it's a nice way to begin the life of structured prayer. Some of you might not be used to that. Some of you might be more inclined to personal prayer. There's nothing wrong with personal prayer, of course. You should continue your personal prayer. But in the Orthodox Church, there's an understanding of that there's a need for structured prayer in addition to our uh, personal prayer. So like I said, each hour is composed of an introduction, which is the Lord's Prayer, uh, Psalm, uh, Thanksgiving Prayer, and Psalm 50. The Thanksgiving prayer, by the way, is the same Thanksgiving prayer that we begin every single liturgical prayer in the church. 
So like when I start liturgy, we pray the Thanksgiving prayer. When I start a wedding, we pray the Thanksgiving prayer. When I start a funeral, we pray the Thanksgiving prayer. Every prayer that in the church of life, the church begins with the Thanksgiving prayer. After the, after the introduction, there's an excerpt from, uh, there are various psalms, there are about 12 psalms in every hour. You don't have to pray all the psalms, you can pray one or two to just get an idea of the, the psalms that are set up for the hour. And then there's an excerpt from the gospel, from a gospel, and then there are small litanies. And then we say, Lord have mercy, 41 times, representing the sufferings of Christ, 39 lashes of Christ, and then the, the crown of thorns and the spear on his side followed by a, a small absolution, and then a conclusion. Why do we use the prayer book of hours? Oh, sorry, this is, this is, that, this is what I just said in the slide form. Sorry, I was uh, one slide behind. Why do we use the prayer book of hours? We use the prayer book of hours when we pray because it teaches us how to pray. First of all, it prolongs our stay in the presence of God. What I mean by that is, if I were to ask you all, you know, I really want you guys to go home and, and, and pray when you get home. You might be able to pray for a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and then you're like, well, I, you know, I don't really know what to say to God. I, I don't know what I would say when I stand in front of Him, or I don't have much to say, or I've said all I needed to say. But it allows me to prolong my, my stay in the presence of God. A person could stand maybe a few minutes and a few words, and then the whole thing is over. I don't find much to say. On the other hand, the worshiper who prays with the prayer book of hours, with the Igbeya, finds it adequately nourishing for prayer enables us to stand before God for you know 10 15 minutes when I when I pray the entire hour and sometimes even longer than that that's why like I said the, the, the prayer book of hours the Igbeya teaches us it's a school of prayer we need to learn how to pray you remember one of the things what did the disciples ask the, when our Lord Jesus Christ when they asked him he, they didn't ask him anything they didn't ask him like teach us how to do a liturgy teach us what confession is like Teach us, you know, how to love our enemies. What did he say? He said, the disciples said, teach us how to pray. And when he said, teach us how to pray, he gave them a prayer. He gave them a recited prayer. Here, when you pray, pray like this. He didn't say, tell me what's in your heart. That's what I want from you. Not to say that that doesn't have a place. Of course, personal prayer is, you're more than welcome to pray to God personally. You should. But he didn't say to them, pray what you feel. Pray what you think. Pray what comes to mind. Pray what's on your heart. He said, no, when you pray, say this. Our Father who art in heaven, so on and so forth, right? So the assistance of the when I have the assistance of the prayer book of hours, I learn to say my prayers and I learn an appropriate way to speak to God, and my tongue and my heart becomes trained in conversing with God, because the the, the prayer book contains all types of prayers. A person who insists on praying with the assistance of the prayer book will probably. Like, if they don't do it, if they're not praying with the, with the prayer book of hours, they'll pray a couple of things and then they'll close their prayer made with Our Father. When I use the Egbeya, when I use the prayer book of hours, I can realize that there are different types of prayers. There are intercessory prayers where I'm asking for things. There are thanksgiving prayers where I'm giving thanks to God. There's prayers for modesty. There's prayers for a broken spirit. There's prayers for confession. There's prayers for repentance. There's prayers for glorification. There's prayers for praise. There's prayers for expressing love. Meditating on the divine characteristics of God. For example, one of the prayers in the, in the prayer book of ours says, Holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. This is a quote from the Isaiah, book of Isaiah, or part of a quote from the book of Isaiah. You're not asking or interceding for anything when you say that. Holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory and honor. I'm not asking for anything when I say that, right? What am I doing? It's not a thanksgiving. It's not prayer for repentance. What am I doing here? Simply glorifying God. Meditating on His holiness and His greatness. At the end of our prayers, we have a conclusion to every hour. It says, Christ, our good Lord, the long-suffering, abundant in mercy and full of compassion, who loves the righteous and is merciful to sinners. I'm here in this instance, meditating on God's beautiful characteristics. He's a good Lord. He's long-suffering, exceedingly merciful, extremely compassionate. He loves the righteous. Merciful to sinners, right? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting, meditating on the beautiful characteristics of God. And following that, if you re continue on to that prayer, then it becomes the, re the request. Who, when he says, is merciful to all sinners, and he says, of whom I am chief, and he say, he's saying like, now I'm asking for forgiveness, given that you are merciful, long-suffering, compassionate, all those things. Okay? 
So the, one of the advantages of the prayer book is it teaches us to offer praise. It teaches us how to pray. It contains multiple and, and important details. Who of us on our own will remember to pray for the forgiveness of our sins which we have committed willingly and unwillingly, knowingly and unknowingly, my sins that are hidden and my sins that are manifest or revealed. All of those are included in, in the prayers to assist us in our prayers. The other, the other like, reason why the church uses the prayer book of hours is it keeps Christ close to us in our daily life. For instance, if every hour, I told you every hour is themed, it's themed on the life of Christ. The first hour commemorates the, the resurrection. Because, of course, if you guys know, uh, Christ uh, rose when? Sunday, when? Very early, very early in the morning, right? So we see that, for example, in the first hour prayers, we commemorate the eternity of God, we commemorate His incarnation, we talk, confess Him as the true light, and we pray that light shine, His light shines on us and enlightens our entire being. In the prayers of the third hour, we commemorate the dissension of the Holy Spirit on the disciples and on the church and on us as individuals. Why? Because in the book of Acts, it says that in Pentecost, that it was the third hour when the disciples received the Holy Spirit. So we commemorate the, the, the descent of the Holy Spirit on us and on the church. In the sixth hour, we commemorate our Lord's crucifixion and the emotions associated with that event because he was crucified in the sixth hour. In the ninth hour, we commemorate two things, the confession of the thief on the cross at the right hand of God and our Lord Jesus Christ's death because he died in the ninth hour. In the eleventh hour, or vespers, sometimes called vespers, we remember those who came to the Lord at the end of the day, the eleventh hour. And we also commemorate taking Christ's body down from the cross, because that happened in the eleventh hour. In the twelfth hour, or compline, as some, sometimes it's called, we remember our death, the transient world, final judgment, and, and, and how we should get ready for that day, the second coming. And also commemorates Christ's burial in the tomb. The twelfth hour is meant to be prayed before I go to bed. And so the church teaches us, before I go to bed, I should remember that sleep is kind of like a, a small death. And I should remember my own death and that my life is not eternal here on earth to remember my death before I go to sleep. There's midnight watches that we pray. Uh, they, can tip, they typically are prayed either late at night or actually technically they're supposed to be prayed in the middle of the night. That's why they're called midnight. And there are three watches. And they commemorate Christ's uh, prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you remember, those of you who are familiar with the story, Christ went to the garden right before his, uh, his uh, betrayal and his crucifixion, and he went to pray. And he told the disciples to stay and watch. And he went to pray, and three times he went to go look at them, and what happened? They were asleep. And so it's as if the church is encouraging us to stay awake, to be vigilant, to pray, even in a time where most people are asleep. What's very nice and beautiful about the prayer book of ours, or the Egbeya, is these same prayers are recited by all the children of the church all over the world. You know, in Egypt, all of Africa, here in the United States, in Asia, in Europe, these same prayers are offered throughout the entire world. Everyone prays with one spirit and one mind. And, and actually have prayed this since probably the 3rd or 4th century. <coughs> like, parts of the Igbeya have existed from the 3rd or 4th century. We read in the... John, there's, a, there's a person <coughs> named St. John Cassian. And he went to go visit... He's from Europe. He went to go visit the, the Egyptian desert. Why did he go visit the Egyptian desert? Is because the monastics were famous in Egypt. Like, if you want to be a real monastic, you would go to Egypt. If you want to be a real monk, you go find true monasticism, you go to Egypt. So he went to go, to go see what they were doing. And when he writes, you, you can go read it in his, uh, in his book's uh, conferences. When he, writes about, uh, when he writes about it, he talks about how they pray the Psalms and then there's a glorification. It's really like, very similar to what we pray even now. So the same, the, the, the concept that we're all praying in unity as one body is, is a really beautiful thing. That same concept applies to the prayers offered during all of the sacraments. Communion, marriage, there are the same liturgies, the same absolutions, same benedictions, the same sanctifications are offered everywhere. Okay, So that is sort of like the, the concept of the prayer book of ours. Uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody got one. And I really like, as an exercise, I would really like if we could try together as a group... Um, Let's try to pray it at night together. I know mornings can be hectic for people sometimes. I would love to pray in the morning at night. Uh, this is one of those things that, you know, if one day you join the church, 
this is something that you work out with your spiritual father. How, what should I pray? How much should I pray? How often should I pray? How long should I pray? Because that will differ from person to person. Their, their own stamina, their own ability, their own their, their spiritual level, their own time, you know, people who... You know, the, the church is very pastoral in the sense of like, I can't just tell everybody, oh, you all have to pray all these seven hours every, every day or else you're not a good Christian. That's not how the Orthodox Church functions. You know, it, it, it's really like this, the, the prayer book of hours is a tool for you in order to, to become close to God. How can this tool help you to become close to God? And that's the way it should be viewed and that's the way it should be used. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. Do we have any announcements or anything like that? Uh, we, have questions. we have questions? Okay, cool. Uh, sorry, it's in the room. Slide over. Cool. Why does God create people that He knows are going to end up going to hell anyway since He knows where they will end up even before they are created? That's a good question that a lot of people tend to like uh, like to ask, and the reason that, that God does this is because God has to allow for us to make our own choice. Imagine the alternative. What's the alternative? The alternative would be Christ. God would only create the people who are going to be saved, right? If God did that, if Christ, if God only created the people who are going to be saved. You wouldn't know anything otherwise. So right, so so it would it would appear as if there is no free will or choice. All of us are being saved. For like no God is not like the way I would look at it is God is not actively punish, punishing or rewarding anybody. We are receiving the consequence or the direct result of our own actions. God has lived God it says in scriptures God does not desire the death of a sinner, but that rather all return and live. The analogy that is always given when we talk about like God's foreknowledge and things like that, is, is one of a school teacher. Those of you who maybe teach in any profession or any way, shape, or form, if you get close to your, your, your kids, the kids that you teach, you know before you give them a test who's going to pass and who's going to fail. Because you know who's been doing their homework, you know who's been paying attention, you know who's bright and maybe who's not so bright. But it wouldn't make sense for you as a teacher to not give people an exam and to say to them, I know you're going to pass and I know you're going to fail and I'll just give you the exam and not give you the exam. Or actually, there's no need for an exam. I will just pass the passers and fail the failers. Because the failers would say, I would like to try. I would like to pass. And so the teacher, in their, in their justice, allows everyone to take the test. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why God creates all of us and allows us the opportunity. This question is very good. So I will never know if I'm saved until Judgment Day. Not exactly. If, I, if I'm living a life faithfully in repentance, I am assured that I am a part of God's salvation. It's not as if I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness, I'm not sure if God loves me or not or wants me or whatever. As long as I am living a life of repentance, a consistent life of repentance, I am assured of my salvation. But that as salvation does not come to me until the last day. Can I lose that? Absolutely. And actually we see that from Scripture. St. Paul talks about servants that were with him and he said, oh, you know what? He loved the present world and he left me. So it was somebody who was with him, a servant, ministering with him. And he said, well, he started to love the present world and he just left. So that's why I say, that's why I'm vigilant in my repentance. But if I'm living an honest life of repentance, living the sacramental life of the church, yes, of course, I'm assured of my salvation. But I'm not assured that I'm going to continue in that, right? I could stop, right? Of my own free will, I could stop. It doesn't seem fair that we're punished by something Adam and Eve did. Isn't God supposed to be fair? This is my point when I was talking about also the salvation of, of Christ. It's also not fair for God to save you without you doing anything about it. Right? God, you don't want God to be fair. You don't want God to be fair. Fairness of God, what we deserve. Let's even put the, the sin of Adam and Eve aside for a second. All of us have made mistakes. Right? Right? If you want God, even in the liturgy, when we pray, we say, uh, according, when we talk about Judgment Day, we say, according to your mercy, O Lord, and not according to our sins. If I'm going to be judged according to my sins, I have no chance. If you want God to be fair, I have no chance. You do not want God to be fair. Okay? I want God to be just. But I, don't want him, I, don't want, I don't want fairness. Fair, we don't deserve the salvation we're getting in the same way that we didn't deserve the punishment that Adam got. Do you see, do you see the, kind of the, 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 the logic there? If I'm never worthy of salvation, why should I give so much effort towards it? 
Well, I didn't say you're not worthy of salvation. What I was saying is that we cannot attain salvation on our own. Salvation is a free gift from God. And you're not working for, like, why should I give much effort to it? I, Christ, he said in the Gospel of St. John, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. <clears throat> so it is a natural representation or outgrowth of my faith that I follow God and love him and therefore keep his commandments. So if I say to you, like, as a family unit, if, I, if we say, okay, I, because you're my son, I love you. But that love consists of disobedience, uh, disrespect, uh, lack, of, lack of attention. It, is there really love there, right? I, I show my love by acting, by the things I do, right? I show my love by the things I do. But I'm not working for myself. I'm not, I'm not earning my salvation. My salvation is given to me. It's a free gift from God. It's, it's me accepting that gift. What's a good tip for someone fasting for the first time? That's actually an amazing question. And, and those of you who have never fasted before and would like to fast, I encourage you to, to begin and to try. But I encourage you actually to reach out to me. Uh, especially if you try for a little bit and you're like, wow, this is really hard. Because those of you who are not used to it, it's difficult. to, to you know, Fasting in the Orthodox Church, if I'm fasting in the correct way, according to the rites of the Church, for example, during Lent, I am to abstain from food completely until a certain time during the day. 10 o'clock, noon, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock p.m., whatever it is that you d discern with your father of confession. And then after that, I break my fast with vegan food. Okay? That sounds very extreme, or that sounds very difficult to do for those of you who are just trying. And actually, it is very difficult to do. Those of you who are, who are converts who, who, who did start fasting, I mean, I know, I know some of you who, d who did it. Th those first couple weeks or times of fasting were hard. And so, like, it needs pastoral care. So I know actually some of you already have reached out to me Hey, uh, Father Theodore, is there a way for me to modify the fast in a way that I'm able to, 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 to do? That's perfectly fine. And you should contact me because I would like you to participate in the fast if you can. But you may not be able to participate in the fast fully quite yet until you sort of get used to the, the, the mechanisms of fasting. How do we know which denomination is right? The right one which leads to our salvation. I, said, I mean, I hope by the end you would think it would be orthodoxy, but you don't have to, I guess. Um, I, I'm hoping, like, when I, when I spoke especially about sort of the, the history of the church, what we use as our sources of teaching, and, and how we come about to having the doctrines that we have, that you would be convinced that what we do is based on the teachings of Christ, based on the teaching of the scriptures, based on the teaching of tradition and the fathers before us. Uh, if not, I, I understand and respect that, then that sort of that would be the goal of, uh, of this course. The prayer book doesn't seem like personal prayer. It is not personal prayer. How do I supplement it? You supplement it with your own personal prayer. Yeah, I, I, wanted, I wanted to make sure that I'm very clear that this does not uh, replace my own prayer. Like, I have something going on in my life, right? I have a, a career issue, a relationship issue, a familial issue, a sickness issue, whatever it is. I want to give thanks to God for stuff. I want to ask God for mercy for something I did wrong. Definitely, I should pray personally. The, the prayer book is, is, is in addition to my personal prayers, to help me, to teach me to pray. I heard that the fasting starts today. It actually started last week. That's okay. How does that help my spiritual life? Uh, actually, I'm going to speak about fasting specifically, uh, I think, in the next lecture. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave that till then. But, but in a nutshell, I will say one of the main tenets of fasting is depriving my body of something it needs, telling my body... The, the, the spirit is what's going to lead this unit. It's not going to be my body. It's not going to be the flesh, right? So your body wants to eat. Just because it wants to eat doesn't mean it needs to eat now. And just because it wants steak doesn't mean it needs to have steak, right? I teach my body that just because I want something doesn't mean I get it. And that translates to other parts of my life. There are desires that I want, that my body wants, that are not good for me. Fleshly desires, desires that are sinful. You know, when I see something really nice at the store, it would be great to just take it, right? My flesh wants it. When I, when I see a, a, you know, a, a, a girl that I'm attracted to, I, I could lust after her. My body wants that person. That doesn't mean I should look. That doesn't mean I should lust after them. So I, I, I maintain control of my body with my spirit. That's really one of the main tenets of fasting. Why would God make the serpent craftier than the rest? Uh, the serpent is... A, a, I don't want to say representation because it is, but, but it is the devil. So the, the serpent is crafter because he fell. The, 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 the angels and the demons had their own fall, right? The, there is a group of, 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 of angels, and we read about that in the Old Testament, that wanted to be like God or better than God or greater than God. 
And so they were cast out of, of heaven. And those once they were cast out of heaven, they resorted to craftiness and evil uh, in order to sort of uh, destroy mankind. Does the church disagree with predestination? And if not, how you how and if not, how you the church say that it is wrong theological thinking? Oh, okay. The church does not agree with predestination. For those of you who don't know, predestination means the belief that God has already decided who is going to be saved and who is not going to be saved, and there's nothing you can do about it. And if you're part of the elect, you're part of the elect, and if you're not part of the elect, too bad. That's the concept of predestination. The reason people believe in predestination or, under, or think about predestination as the correct view is because they say, well, doesn't God know who's going to be saved and who's not? All of us sitting in the room, God knows. God knows you're going to be saved and you're not and you're not and you are. You know, God knows that. But there's a difference. The Orthodox Church believes there's a difference between predestination and foreknowledge. So God knows whether you and I are going to be saved or not. But it is not God who made that determination. It is my actions that make that determination. My willingness to accept God or not. He doesn't force me. And we know this because even in the life of Christ, he never forced anybody, even in his own life, to follow him. Those who wanted to, wanted to. Those who did not, did not. So we are given free will. The biggest problem with predestination is it really negates our free will and actually works against the justice of God. How is it just for God to randomly decide you are saved and you're not saved? Based on what? Based on what? That's why the Orthodox Church rejects a concept of predestination. Do you as a priest read the prayer book of hours on a daily basis? One of the main tenets of the church, one of the, and we read this in the Gospel of St. Matthew, we read it actually last week, is when I pray, I pray in secret. So, I mean, I wouldn't tell you exactly what I pray and, and how much I pray because my prayer is supposed to be between me and God. But, but yes, I have a prayer rule, and yes, my, my father of confession knows my prayer rule, just like you guys would have a prayer rule, and your father in confession knows your prayer rules. But either you would be very impressed by my prayer rule, or you'd be very hurt by my prayer Either way, so it doesn't really, it's not really like positive for me to share with you what my prayer rule is. It, it wouldn't really, doesn't really help your own salvation. Uh, why even create Adam and Eve? Okay, we kind of talked about this. And we talked about assurance of salvation. What does uh, orthodoxy have to say about the evil eye? We don't believe in that. Okay, yeah. Evil eye, I think it's like so this idea of concept of jealousy being spread as some sort of infection or disease. It's like a Middle Eastern thing, I think. It's not really like an orthodox thing. Okay, we'll go ahead and pray.